Powered by MPB, this is Chalkboard Chat, an MPB education podcast, hosted by Jermaine Flood and Tara Wren. To hear this episode and more, visit education.mpbonline.org or download the MPB public media app to listen on your iPhone or Android device. Welcome to Chalkboard Chat. I'm your host, Jermaine Flood. This is our Mississippi Counselors Appreciation 2022 episode. We are showing appreciation to counselors across the state of Mississippi. And in today with me, I have Dr. Heath Stevens. He is a professional school counselor for the Office of Academic Affairs at the Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science in Columbus, Mississippi. Dr. Stevens, welcome to Chalkboard Chat. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us here. I just want to delve into your counselor brain a little bit as your role in professional school counseling for the Office of Academic Affairs at the Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science. Can you tell me a little bit about the school and is it specifically just for students who are primarily in mathematics and science based subject area? I'd be happy to tell you about MSMS. Um, I'm actually also an alum of MSMS many years ago, but so I know I know a little bit about it from both the student and sort of the professional side of things. We are a two-year residential high school for students who are identified as academically gifted in the state of Mississippi. So students will apply during their sophomore year, um, and they come to MSMS for their junior and senior years of high school. Definitely a strong interest in STEM is important, um, but we also have some very great artistic students and students really interested in English and the other humanities as well. So we have kind of the full range of students and we have, we try to have around 250 students or so is what we've been having most recently. We may be a little bit shy about that now with the pandemic situation with recruitment. We see ourselves as an extension of like all the different homeschools. It's kind of interesting because you know, most high schools, they have like a certain feeder district, if you will. Our feeder district are literally all the other schools in Mississippi, both public and private. Um, and even we have some homeschooled students as well. So we have the full gambit of students um, uh, who are gifted that are coming to us for some, that little extra kick into math, science, or just sort of, uh, I guess, more rigorous academic courses in general. But that's what we hear. We're here to help gifted students. And those two years, does that happen in their last final two, the junior and senior year? Correct. Junior and senior year of high school. Right. That's so amazing that you're actually a product of that school and then you have come back to work there. And so I don't know, how do the students receive you and do they know that you were a student at one time? Usually that comes out fairly quickly. Either they see my picture on like the list of graduates or something outside on the walls or like when we introduce ourselves at the beginning of the school year. Um, I will usually mention it. You know, it's an interesting situation that literally half our student population changes every year since it's just juniors and seniors. Right. But I think that um, most of the students do kind of get to know me pretty well. I get to know them pretty well. And I think I would say that a lot of them do like the fact that I'm an alum here because actually some of the teachers we still have here were teachers that I had when I was here. So I can give them a little bit of insight of what my experience was like when I was a student here. So I think they can appreciate that. I'm not just some random person um, <laughs> because it's kind of hard to understand how difficult and challenging MSMS is if you don't go through it yourself. Right, right. So I'm just going to jump into it because I could talk about this school forever now that you've given me a history lesson on it. But when it comes down to maybe you pursuing a career in counseling, where did that come from? Where was that journey into counseling? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting story. You know, often life takes us certain places we didn't necessarily expect to go. And that is certainly the case for me. Um, After I graduated from MSMS, I went on and majored in biology and psychology. Honestly, I couldn't decide which one I liked more, so I just did them both. <laughs> and as, as, as of course, though, you have to graduate at some point. So when I was coming to the end of like my time in undergraduate, and I was trying to decide. I love them both still, but I kind of thought I wanted to do something more impactful, working with people directly. So I kind of the best option I had available to me at the time was kind of pursuing a degree in school counseling. So I was actually job searching and this opportunity was made known to me. And I was like, hey, why not give back to a place that gave me so much? Right, right. Good stuff, Doc. So when it comes down to being a school counselor, do you deal in both academic counseling and emotional counseling as well? 
Very much so, very much so. And matter of fact, in many days, we do more of the emotional counseling, so to speak, than the academic counseling. We certainly do the things to try to help students like with their study skills and all the things of that nature to prepare them for college and career planning, that sort of thing. But definitely, we have a lot of students um, these days with they have so much on their plate. Um, so they have to deal with things like also depression and anxiety or pretty much the full range of um, mental health issues at any school. We have that too. I think sometimes that there's a myth that maybe gifted students, well, they're smart, they're okay, they don't have any issues. Well, the reality is they have the same issues as typical students as well. And being that we're in this hotbed of a pressure cooker situation of like really rigorous academics, sometimes we have students that did not have a lot of mental health issues manifest at their old school, but it kind of pops out here since there's that extra stress level. As it relates to the pandemic, have you seen an increase in maybe cases that are coming up with students that you've noticed? We certainly have. Like as as probably wouldn't surprise no one, we've had a lot of students during the lockdown situation experiencing a lot of isolation. We also tend to have a lot of students that they like to come to MSMS because they don't necessarily like a lot of things that are happening in either their home situation or perhaps their home school situation. So they kind of see us as an escape for them, a chance to kind of be with people like themselves and people that can relate to them and understand them. So when they're kind of were forced to kind of stay at home, that kind of created some additional issues of isolation and things like that. Or the students who were here and then they have to go back home either temporarily or like when we were rotating students on and off campus. So yeah, that was some definitely some challenging things there. And of course, we uh, pretty much all of our students have had family members impacted uh, with COVID-19 as well. So and we've had certainly have those who have family members pass away and things like that as well. So certainly grief has gone up as well, I would imagine. Right. Amongst our students. What are some things maybe that you say to them to kind of help them get over these issues, to kind of help them work through it? Well, I would argue that it's more important. It's not what we say, it's what, what we do, which in this case would be listen. Because nine times out of 10, these students don't always have someone that can really listen to them or try to understand where they're coming from. So listening, I always start with listening first. And if you can listen well enough, you can try to understand the situation and hopefully go from there. So that's where I would start. But a lot of things I try to tell them, we try to focus on, we do some solution-focused counseling. And we try to focus on things that that are going to be helpful for them, try to think of their short-term girl goals and connect them with their long-term goals. Those things, of course, but mostly we just really need to listen and kind of reflect back that, yes, times are hard. It's not just hard for all of us, you know, it's hard for everyone, but it's hard for you personally because of X, Y, Z, and we get that. I love the idea of listening, and and I don't know what other qualities outside of you being a counselor that you maybe deem as important to possess to being a great counselor. Well, that is a great question, <laughs> and I, as I'm thinking about that, I think that in order to, to in order for even to be able to listen to a student, you have to have them come up to you and actually be willing to open up and talk to you about things. So I think probably the most important thing for all counselors anywhere is going to be establishing rapport with a student. So basically building that professional relationship and being open and open to those students in many different ways. So I think if you aren't able to build that rapport and not able to create those professional relationships so the students trust you, well, then it's going to be hard to do anything else until that trust is established. Right. Tell me a story now about a student maybe that you've helped. Oh, gosh, there have been so many. I've been fortunate <laughs> to work here for um, this is my 10th year, actually. So Yay, just trying to narrow uh, that down would be the, would the, be the hard challenging thing. thing. <laughs> Definitely. What's well, the one I, that floats to the top? <laughs> OK, um, well, it's actually um, the one that floats to the top. Um, we had a young lady. This was several years ago now. As a matter of fact, she recently graduated undergraduate, I believe, and is starting law school. If she had she may have already started now. I think about it since it's the spring semester. Right. But um, she, she had definitely come from like a low income background that sort of thing. And then she had sort of developed these mo coping mechanisms where she had to be the tough person, had to be the tough person. Well, I tried very hard to kind of break through those barriers a little bit and just let her know she can just be herself. And so she would not cry in front of anyone, but she cried in my office a number of times, but, oh. but she certainly wouldn't let anyone else know that. But so that ability to sort of be vulnerable greatly helped her, um, I believe, as she went on to pursue things. And like I said, now going to law school, I think. Um, and she also happens to be um, 
a student that I tend to think of sometimes so she's actually, you know, in education, you know, we do our job, you know, not for the money, certainly, but she happened to also send me an email not that long ago, kind of just sort of a general check in thanking me for what happened. And I would say that those are some of what for me anyway would be like a, one of my greatest accomplishments, not the certificates or the awards, but just hearing back from students that, hey, you know what, you made a small impact for me a few years ago. I appreciate you. And there's been a few other opportunities that where students have sort of like said, hey, you know, I'm going to nominate you for this award. I'm like, thanks. You know, I don't have to do that. I mean, I don't necessarily, even if I don't win, you know, it's just kind of an honor that the students even remember who we are. I'm actually surprised sometimes when students who have graduated, they come back to visit, they even remember my name. I'm like, oh, that's great. You remember me. That's nice. I appreciate that. So to me, those things are what stand out most to me about that sort of thing. Right. Good stuff, Dr. Stevens. Well, I just thank you so much for your time. And is there anything that you'd like to maybe leave my listeners with as it relates to counseling and maybe connecting with students? Well, the only thing I would like to leave everyone with is just know that school counselors are there to help students. So again, academically, college and career-wise, personally, socially. So please don't be afraid to reach out and definitely communicate with your local school counselor if you have some concerns about students. We love hearing about what's going on so that we can help us uh, basically help your students. This has been a conversation with Dr. Heath Stevens. He's a professional school counselor for the Office of Academic Affairs at the Mississippi School for Mathematics and Science in Columbus, Mississippi. He has been a great addition to the chat. And I just thank you so much, Dr. Stevens, for joining us today. Thank you again for having me. In today, I have Tiffany Durr. She is a school counselor at Northwest Rankin High School, actually my alma mater. And she is also a parent of one of our MPB student council members, Mr. Jack Durr. Miss Tiffany Durr, welcome to the show. Thank you. What was your fondest memory of a chalkboard or non-fondest memory of a chalkboard from your childhood? Oh, well, okay. So in fifth grade at Northside Elementary in Pearl, our teacher, she really encouraged like creativity. I wrote a short story about a teacher who was not very bright. And whenever the students went to resource, the chalkboard gave her all of the answers. And I just remember her making a huge deal out of it, calling my parents, telling her what a great job I had done on that story and said that, you know, I should probably get it published. I don't remember a whole lot about it. Fifth grade's been a long time ago, but that's, I guess, my biggest memory of chalkboard. So cool. I love that. And, and I the, love the, the, of the story was talky chalky. So there you go. <laughs> I love the fact that, that that was your favorite memory and now we're moving all the way and you were just telling me that you've been an educator before you were a school counselor so what made you want to transition from actual teaching into counseling at school okay so my dad was actually a teacher and a coach for more than 35 years and growing up I grew up in the field house um, around schools I knew I always wanted to do something in education I uh, was always really intrigued by history, told him I wanted to be some type of history teacher. And of course, the coach in him said, you'll never find a job. You know, you need to choose something else because they're just going to hire male coaches in those social studies positions. But I'm a little hard headed. So I did get my degree in secondary ed in social studies. But I did at least take his advice when he said, make yourself open to be able to be employable, find other things that you can be certified in so that, you know, you'll be attractive to employers. And he also did tell me to get as many degrees early on as I could because, you know, teachers don't make as much money as some other professions do. But he said the more degrees that you have at the higher level, the more money you'll make. So I did at least take his advice there. I've been in education for 22 years. My first 11, I spent as a teacher and a coach. You know, not to necessarily toot my own horn, but I was a pretty successful coach. We oh, we're several, tooting, we're tooting. <laughs> several state championships. But the thing that always the, the girls' parents would come back and say is, you know, they even in adulthood say, well, Miss Durr said, Miss Durr said, and I kind of felt like I was almost like a personal cheerleader for them, not just coaching them dance or cheerleading, but also coaching them about life. And it's just something I enjoy do. I like helping people, finding solutions to problems. So, you know, 
graduated in 2000 from USM with my bachelor's in secondary ed. Immediately in those summers, I started to go in. I went and got my master's degree in secondary ed social studies as well in curriculum and instruction. Did my national board certification in the same thing the following year. So I finished that in 2005. And then after that, I knew I wanted to get some advanced degree. So the one that made most sense to me was school counseling, something that I could see myself doing later on. I didn't intend to do it, you know, exactly when I did, but I was fortunate that I was able to get a position at Pearl High School and I've been now a counselor. This is my 11th year. Right. So when you're when you're dealing with counseling there at Northwest Rankin, do you deal with both the academic and the emotional side of counseling? Yes, we do. Um, So we have a comprehensive school counseling program. We not only help them academically with choosing classes, you know, making a plan. One of the things that I'm particularly responsible for is the seniors. And so in addition to what they have to do to graduate from high school, you know, it's also one of my responsibilities to work with our college and career ready teachers to help them make that transition from high school to college. So yes, and then of course we do deal with mental health as well. A lot of times we do end up having to refer outside of school, but we deal with students who come in, you know, sometimes they just have, you know, minor little hiccups, things that they're upset about. And sometimes we even deal with crisis situations. Now, when it comes down to qualities that you maybe think are important to possess to being a great school counselor, what are some of those for you? I think just being genuine, being a great listener, being someone who is willing to, you know, find out an answer when you don't know the answer to it. But I will say that just in my own practice, especially in the last several years, as my children have gotten older, you know, I feel like that I do my job every day and try to live by the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated. So when students come in my office, you know, my main concern is if this were my own child, what would I do? When a parent contacts me, I treat them the way I would want to be treated as a mother of school age children. And I have found that using that policy, I can't go wrong. You know, I may not have the answer for them right then, but if I would expect for someone to find the answer and get back to me, then that's exactly what I do for them. Right. And Jack, as an MPB student council member, is a great child. So you have done well with even your own. So thank I just you. thank we you for being proud of him. Yes. I'm thankful that you are the great counselor and mother that you are as well. So now I know that you're part of a bigger team there, not just you as maybe the only counselor at Northwest Rankin, but it's said that students benefit when the student population is reflected in their educators, but sometimes demographics differ between students, teachers, and even counselors counselors in the same school or even district. So how do you as a counselor address this to ensure that none of your students feel left behind? Well, and you may remember this since you are an alumni of Northwest Rankin High School, but we are a very large school. We have nearly 1,800 students, and they are from very diverse backgrounds. Lots of ethnicities are represented in our student body. And one thing that I would say we are lucky is that even our counseling team is diverse. So there are four of us total. We have one male counselor, and then there, the other three of us are females. But even with our ethnicity, we, mm-hmm. we are diverse as well. So, you know, that is a great thing to have those partners with me. There have been situations where I have had a student who just maybe doesn't relate to me as well. Maybe they relate to one of the other counselors. And even though we're set up by an alphabetical division of students and then grade level as well, we have no problem saying, hey, look, if we can't get the job done in here, if you feel more comfortable talking to a male counselor or to one of our black counselors, so be it. But ultimately, at the end of the day, No matter what race, you know, what gender a student is, what their sexual orientation or beliefs, religious beliefs, any of them that walk through the door, we're going to help them. Right. They're in our alphabet or not, or if we, you know, don't have the same views as them. What has been your greatest accomplishment as a school counselor? Well, you know, I've kind of tried to think about that, but I think that I would say that my accomplishments have been seeing the things that my students have done. So really and truly, it's more their accomplishments, you know, seeing students who 
maybe thought that they couldn't even graduate from high school, but they were able to do it and to see the pride on their parents' faces at graduation, just those little thank yous that you get back. Like I could have never made it if you hadn't been there, you know, to see me through it each day, every step of the way. Students who come back and say, I would have never known about this leadership opportunity or this scholarship. I would have never gotten this recognition. So I would say a lot of my accomplishments are just seeing the things that I let them know about and that I support them through and then therefore they're recognized. If I had to say one that I would consider a personal accomplishment, I would say the use of technology um, to transform kind of what we do. Several years back, probably in about 2018, a coworker and I, I think, were some of the first school counselors to utilize Canvas, an online learning platform for counseling. And then when some of the folks in our district kind of caught wind of it, I know one of the ladies in our information technology department, she had us present to Mecca district administrators from across the state about how we utilize Canvas. It was us and several other teachers as as well that were being highlighted for work that we had done using Canvas. And then later on, my coworker and I presented at the Mississippi Counseling Association Conference. And now our district, every school has a counseling Canvas course where we're able to push out information. So I tried to, I feel, I feel accomplished in trying to become more technologically savvy and keeping up with the times so that I can provide services for our students because they know more about technology than I ever thought about. Kudos to you on the whole technology advancement. Thank you. <laughs> you are welcome. And I just thank you so much for joining us. Is there anything you'd like to maybe leave our listeners with as it relates to school counseling and maybe your passion for it? Well, I would just tell parents, if you are not already involved in school and haven't met your child's school counselor, reach out to them. I I feel like I can speak confidently about my peers and colleagues in this field of work, but there is a lot of information that we are responsible for knowing, and it is ever-changing. And also, every day we wear lots of different hats, but we are here. We are here for these students, and we are here for these parents. That is our ultimate responsibility. Right. That's some good advice. Miss Tiffany Durr, she is one of the counselors that we appreciate here on Chalkboard Chat. And she is a counselor at Northwest Rankin High School. And I thank her for joining us here on the chat. Thank you so much, Miss Durr. Thank you, Jermaine. In with me right now, I have Miss Laura Dean. She's a school counselor with Gentry High School in Indianola, Mississippi. Miss Dean, welcome to Chalkboard Chat. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have you here. So I want to dive into why you are one of those counselors that we appreciate here at MPB and on Chalkboard Chat. So let's just jump right in. Tell me now, what led you to pursue a career in school counseling and how long have you been doing it? So I am current, I have currently been a school counselor for 16 years. It all started on the campus of Alcorn State University. I was a history major. And so my history professor noticed that I enjoy helping and assisting others. So he pulled me to the side one day and he said, Ms. Dean, he said, I think you should pursue a master's in counseling. And so I graduated in December of 04. And then January of 05, I started my counseling journey at Alcorn State, May of 06, I graduated. And July of 06, I was able to come back home to Gentry where I graduated high school and was able to give back to the students of the Indianola community. Right, right. So you had a passion for this or was this something like once you had gotten in it, it was like, yes, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. (laughs) Yes, actually, because I actually... I didn't even want to be in education. I'm going, I'm going to be honest. I didn't (laughs) want to be in education. I wanted to be a lawyer, but my parents were educators and my family was educators. And so once I got into history, I love, love history. Then I delved over into counseling. Uh So once I got into it, I said, okay, this is my calling. This is where I am supposed to be. Yeah. Good stuff. I love that. I love (laughs) that story. Cause it's just, you know, every man's story, basically somebody's like, you need to do this. And then you went on and you did it. So I love that. I love that. I love, love, love love my high school. I love high school uh, students because I can relate to them. Yeah. Tell me about 
Gentry High School now. You just mentioned before we got on this interview, you are literally the only counselor for grades 10 through 12 at Gentry. How is that? How do you manage being the only one? <laughs> I am managing. I, I am managing. Uh, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I, I love working with the students and, and I get to see their faces, especially when it's, it's the seniors. Mm -hmm. I really love my seniors because they're getting ready to embark into the real world. So it is imperative that we really, really work closely with our seniors because they're getting ready to get out into the real world. And we need to show them what the real world will possibly look like. Right. And so I enjoy all of my babies, but my seniors is my, my focal point because right. they're getting ready to go. And there's so, so much information that they need that we need to offer them as, as counselors, as teachers, as administrators to help them in the real world. Right, right. Have the seniors mentioned anything about being back and maybe feeling a certain way about being back? Are they excited about literally being back? Or? I think everybody is excited. I think the teachers are excited. I'm excited. The administration, everybody's excited about being back. And so our school, Gentry is unique because the seniors this year were 100% virtual last year. The juniors this year were 100% virtual last year. And then the 10th graders, which were ninth graders and was at the middle school, mm -hmm. they were virtual. So, you know, it's almost like there was a gap. There was a missing piece because we didn't get a chance to connect the faces with the names and all that until this year. So there, there was there was a big gap and it, it was it was a, it made a difference. But now we're back in the building, learning is taking place and we're excited. Yeah, it's almost like the first day of school at kindergarten. It is, it is, it's it like is. starting all over. <laughs> all over. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. Good stuff. And I know that you are probably one of those counselors that these 10th through 12th graders really do rely on. What do you consider being specific qualities and important qualities of a counselor to possess to be able to reach students? Two of the most important qualities that a counselor should possess is listening and observing. You have to listen to your students when they're telling you things because most times, in most cases, the students know what's going on before the adults do. Mm -hmm. So you have to listen and then you have to observe their actions. You have to know, you have to know your students and you have to know if Johnny is not having a good day, that means it's something wrong with Johnny because he talks every day. So if he comes in and he's quiet, something is happening. And so you have to be observant and you have to pull that child to the side and say, Johnny or Sally, what's going on? I know something's wrong because you're not yourself today. Mm -hmm. A discernment. That's a good, that, I love it. I just love that idea too, of being able to meet them where they're at. And if they're not telling you where they're at, right. you're able to read through that. So because it's not always the boisterous students. And, you know, we say that all the time in our meeting, it's the quiet child. It's a child that's sitting there that's quiet, that needs attention, just as a child that's, that's loud and boisterous. Mm -hmm. And look, this is a side note, and I had said this on the last interview, though, but you know, they had just, um, I, don't I don't know if she was a Lanier High School student out here in Jackson, but she had took her life um, right out here in Jackson on the I-55 right, right. bridge. That was so, so sad. She was a Murrah High School student. Oh, she was Murrah. Okay, she was a Murrah High School. But it, it was so, so sad and it was so unfortunate. And I, I, I even reflected back to our students. You know, that could easily happen here. And of course, we would ever, ever want that to happen. But you just never know where mental illness or any of that is. You, you don't know. So that's why it's just, it's imperative to, to be alert to be vigilant and to be watchful. Right. I love it. I love it, Ms. Dean. Thank you so <laughs> much for doing what you do there too. Thank um, you. So out of all the years, the 16, you told me, and congratulations <laughs> on your 16. Thank you. But out of all of those 16 years, what has stood out in your mind as your greatest accomplishment? One of my most rewarding accomplishments is to see my students graduate from high school. That's like one of the biggest things that I can sit back and look and I'm proud. It's a proud, a proud counselor moment. When the students go across the stage and they're getting their diplomas and most of them will say, Ms. Dean, I did it. And so it's, and it almost brings tears to your eyes because some of those students that you see are kids who struggled. They struggled at home and they struggled in the classrooms and to see those students go across the stage and say they did it. That is one of the most rewarding moments that I, and that's every year in May when we have our graduate, that, that is always one of my proudest counselor moments. 
Is there anything that you would like to leave my audience with as it relates to school counseling? I would like to leave this. Parents and teachers, everybody, help us to help your children. The schools cannot do it all. I know the parents can't do it all, the churches, the administrators, but help us, help us to help the students. It all goes back to, it starts at home. And so if, if the parents would do you know, their part, and once you send them to us, we're guaranteed to do our part. And then we'll send them out into the real world so that they can become productive citizens. I thank, thank you, you so thank you. much for joining us here on Chalkboard Chat. This is Ms. Laura Dean. She is one of the school counselors that we appreciate here on Chalkboard Chat for 2022 and beyond, of course. And she is a school counselor with the Gentry High School in Indianola, Mississippi. And I thank her again for being here on Chalkboard Chat. Thank you again, Ms. Blood, for having me. Welcome to Chalkboard Chat. I am Jermaine Flood, and this is our Mississippi Counselor Appreciation 2022 episode. And with me right now, I have Miss Belinda Tudor. She's a K through two school counselor at Moorville Elementary School in Leake County. Miss Tudor, welcome to Chalkboard Chat. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Now, how long have you been a school counselor, and were you an educator before that? I have been an educator for, this is my 20, I'm ending my 22nd year. Okay. So, but I have been a school counselor for eight years. Okay. So this is a second part of my career as an educator. I love it. When was that pivotal moment as an educator that led you to pursue a career in counseling? Well, there were two incidents. When my mind goes back, I was a fifth grade math teacher and I had, in the same school year, I had a student whose mother was killed in a, a drug interaction go bad. And he, I just remember him coming to school and just coming around my desk and just laying his head over on me. And I'm talking about a big fifth grade boy, you know, yeah. and just weeping. And I remember feeling like, what do I do? You know, what can I do to help this child? So that was one moment. And then I had another moment that same year where a child in my classroom was assaulted by her stepfather. And that just, it, it just made me want more. It made me want to be able to help these children more. We had an outstanding school counselor, but it was difficult for her to be able to get to all the students, you know, and she did her best, but that just lit a fire in me that I wanted to know how to help these children. Yeah. So that's where it started. Yeah, that's a beautiful story. I love the fact that, you know, you, you were, your heartstrings had been pulled to the point to where it was like, maybe I need to move from this position into this position to kind of fulfill what it is that I'm feeling on the inside. So right. I love Absolutely. that. What qualities do you think are important to possess as a school counselor to be able to help these children kind of, you know, find their way and make their way? I think that I go back to Carl Rogers. He's person-centered. I use a lot of other techniques as well, a lot of other theories, but I think just the genuineness being truly genuine with the students. I think that being fully present with them when they're here in my office or if I'm in their classroom, wherever the interaction takes place, just letting them know that they are heard. You know, I hear you. I am here for you. I think that just go, it just goes a long way with, with kids. I think especially for kindergarten through second grade, because it's their first experience in school. And for some of them, you know, a lot of the things that they're facing, they've, they've never faced before. They've not been in a preschool setting. Right. So I think just letting them see a familiar face, a smile on my face, and just being a genuine person really goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. And then you've got the cutie pies. You've got the babies. Once they see the smile, I know it. Once they see the smile, they're already, you know, hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> right. And I have a line every morning. I have, we do snacks here for students who need snacks. And so they're on my table in my office and I have a line that come through and they'll just give me the biggest hug. It's like, okay, Miss Tudor, get my day started. You know, right. I love it. It gets my day started too. Aww. So I just like being that person 
time for them. Yeah, yeah, I love it. And I love the the ages that you service. So <laughs> just too cute. Now, I know that you are, again, you know, K through second grade, but as it deals with maybe parents too, it's said that students benefit when the student population is reflected in their educators. Mm -hmm. So how do you as a counselor maybe address this to ensure that the parents know, especially for your K through second graders, that their student won't feel left behind maybe? Well, I think that the first thing that I do that I have to do is do a self-assessment, you know, and just really be honest with myself and and who I am and what my beliefs are and and where I stand and then I think it's easier to just see the child for who they are see the child not the behavior mm -hmm. well for me I just see the child and it's difficult sometimes especially if you're dealing with behavior but as far as being different we have a, a large diverse population and so I just want the kids to see themselves in the curriculum that I use. I use a lot of children's books. So I make sure the children see themselves in that. I make sure parents feel comfortable in my office if they come to visit me. I try to help build a bridge between teachers and parents, just, just being me. And when someone comes in my, my office, you know, I don't want them to feel like, oh, I have to, you know, and, and everything. I just want them to feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So just, just meeting them where they are and being, being true to who I am yeah. and, and just sharing as people. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. I love it. And then again, of course, I got to go back to the babies this age right <laughs> here. You know, you know, it's very few and far between that they know color or difference or anything like that when it deals with demographics. So you, you have those angels that you're literally molding into, mm -hmm. you know, great human beings as you right. being that school counselor for them. So and I do try to advocate here for for sameness. I mean, for my children not to see that in anyone, you know, because this is their first school experience. And so I want them not to feel any different, but just to feel like this is where I belong. Right. You know? And I think we do a pretty good job of that here at our school. Right, right. Good stuff. I love it, Miss Tudor. I love all of it. Okay, so in the eight years that you've been sitting in the capacity as school counselor, what has been your greatest accomplishment so far? Well, professionally, I would have to say that this past year I was named Mississippi School Counselor of the Year. What? Yay! So, so that was an experience that I grew from and I'm still growing from. But as the school counselor day in, day out, that's right here in this school, it is seeing the growth and the progress in my students. Yeah. Um, if I have a student that's on a, on a behavior plan or a, has behavior interventions, Watching those children grow and seeing them come from a tier three down to a tier two and then get back on the regular tier one instruction and behavior and being in that classroom. I mean, that's where it's at yeah. you know, as, as an accomplishment. Seeing that is 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 where it's at for me. Yeah. Good stuff. It was for the entire state, Miss Tudor. Yes, it was. What? It was. Oh, um, yes, Dr. Ford. She is our um, school counselor leader for M the Mississippi Department of Education. So she came to my school and they surprised me with a huge presentation of an award and and they had my whole family there. So, yes, they did great things for me. <laughs> Good stuff. So yeah. to my chalkboard chat listeners, we literally have the Mississippi School Counselor of the Year, Miss Tudor, on the chat with us today. And I just thank her so much for being here with us. Miss so awesome. Tudor, is there anything you want to leave my listeners with? I think that if, you know, as far as for parents and teachers and school counselors, it's just being fully present with your students, with your children, setting aside that time where that child feels valued and where that child feels heard. If there's anything at all that I could just say, this is so important, that would be it. Be fully present with your children and let them know that you hear them. 
thank you so much for coming so on and being one of those counselors that we appreciate this year for 2022. And congratulations to you on the accolade of being school counselor of the year for the state of Mississippi. So thank you so much. Thank you again, Miss Tudor. This has been Miss Belinda Tudor. She is a K through second grade school counselor with Moorville Elementary School in Elite County, Mississippi. And she has been great on the chat today. I thank her again. And this has been Chalkboard Chat. Class is now dismissed. You've been listening to Chalkboard Chat, an MPB education podcast. To hear this episode and more, visit education.mpbonline.org or download the MPB public media app to listen on your iPhone or Android device. This podcast is hosted with love by ACAS.